So, welcome everybody. Um, this talk for today is uh, by Satya and Mali. Um, they have looked at the security, or maybe you could say insecurity, of um, home automation systems, in this case, the Homematic. Um, and I won't waste your time, so please give them a big round of applause, um, Satya and Mali. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Satya. And I'm Mali. And in the next 45 minutes, we are going to tell and show you how to sniff homematic device traffic, how to emulate homematic devices, and how to attack a homematic system. This talk only focuses on the wireless traffic, so we are not talking about the wired components at all. And we are also not covering the numerous security issues of the LAN interface. So, uh, who of you does already use a uh, home automation system? Ah. Okay, and who of you does already use Homematic? Okay, a few. And who plans to install a home automation system in the future? Okay. This is, ah, great. Um, this is the outline of our talk. First, we are talking a little bit about homematic in general. Then um, we, have you, we have to bore you with a little theory about the wireless packets of homematic. And then we will demonstrate you live um, three possible different attacks. Um, these three attacks cover pretty much everything, means, uh, meaning after these attacks, you can, as an attacker, control pretty much all the homematic device, except um, when you're not using the default AES key when you changed it. Okay, homematic in general. Our original motivation was we wanted to control valve drives directly. We were not satisfied um, with the built-in temperature control algorithms of um, the thermal control devices. And yeah, soon found out uh, that it is not possible to control valve drives directly. Yeah. Initially, we just wanted to write uh, a new for firmware for the valve drive device. But that soon exacerbated into developing our own interface software to control homematic devices, which we later named Home Gear. So um, let's show us an example configuration. Maybe you want uh, to start with uh, some kind of uh, starter kit. Um, maybe you want uh, to unlock your door and switch on the light with a remote control. And if you're satisfied, maybe you want to add further components uh, to the system. And therefore, you may want uh, to have um, a control center. This may consist of a LAN configuration adapter in combination with a server running a BitCos service software and uh, a home, uh, home automation um, um, administration software. Or uh, you may use a standalone control center unit with a firmware doing um, as well as uh, the job uh, as well the job of the Bitcoin service um, as uh, uh, further functions. <coughs> or you may use a um, Raspberry Pi with a um, wireless adapter extension um, running home gear software. Um, then you can add uh, devices like a smoke detector team or uh, thermal controls uh, to regulate uh, your room temperature. Yes, um, in the very beginning, we started by opening a valve drive device, and inside we found a uh, an Atmel microcontroller, a wireless uh, transceiver module hidden uh, in the back, and uh, of course a motor and a gear. 
uh, this device is uh, provided in a very Tampa-friendly version, um, providing the um, communication interface between the microcontroller and the uh, transceiver module uh, as a pin header. So well, we sniffed uh, the traffic uh, on this uh, um, communication interface with uh, a logic analyzer and uh, yeah, and soon understood how the device works, and um, we could soon emulate this valve drive. Actually, on this valve drive, as you can see here, probably maybe. Um, um, is already running our own firmware, which we later did not develop anymore because it was not necessary. Okay, the wireless packets. The protocol used by the homematic devices is called BITCOS, which stands for Bidirectional Communication Standard, and uh, yeah, works on a frequency of 868 megahertz as a lot of um, wireless home automation system. And all the bit cost packets look like this. Um, first, you see the packet length, um, which does not include itself. So uh, the length counts only the um, bytes after uh, yeah, the length. Then um, the first byte is a message counter, which um, increments by one with each message exchange or packet exchange. Um, byte one is the control byte, which, for example, um, encodes the information here at bit five um, that the um, communication is bidirectional. This bit, for example, means that uh, there um, um, is a response expected to this packet. Byte two is the type of the message. Byte three to five, the sender address. Six to eight, the destination address. And after that, the payload. Um, there is one special destination address, zero, three bytes zero, um, which is the broadcast address. Um, since most of the homematic uh, devices are um, battery powered, you will need uh, some kind of uh, power saving strategy. Um, the first um, power saving strategy is called uh, wake on radio and is, uh, <clears throat> uh, it works uh, the following. Um, the device uh, wakes up to receive ready mode for 2.4 milliseconds, and um, after that it falls asleep for 350 milliseconds uh, repeatedly. So it, it can um, <clears throat> react um, on uh, um, packages almost uh, immediately. Um, the second uh, type of power saving strategy is uh, the wake me up mode. In this mode, the device uh, sends a wake me up packet, then is uh, in receive ready mode for 250 milliseconds, and then falls asleep for a variable but deterministic amount of time. Uh, this mode is uh, used by some devices uh, for which uh, do not have to be reachable um, all the time when they want uh, to uh, exchange information with the uh, uh, central. They uh, send a, a wake me up uh, packet uh, in broadcast mode and the central uh, can react and uh, initiate uh, data transfer. Um, the third power saving strategy is almost the same as uh, the mode above, but without a wake me up packet. This mode is uh, used by a thermal control device and a, um, valve drive device. Uh, one slide back, please. Um, the receive ready mode uh, draws about uh, 14 milliamperes of uh, current, so that the battery would be empty in about one week. 
so if you um, use a wake on radio mode, uh, the average uh, current draw is uh, reduced to about 100 microamps. And um, uh, the other modes uh, reduce the current draw to about uh, uh, 20 microamps. Plus, additionally, uh, the power, uh, the, the current draw of the motor and the microcontroller, so that the batteries can last uh, one year or even longer. Okay. One important thing about. Um, the BitCos protocol is that the communication is completely unencrypted. Um, but for some devices, like for example the Keymatic, which opens, which locks and unlocks your door, um, of course you need some kind of authentication so that not anybody can unlock your door to your apartment or house. Um, for this authentication, an AES Challenge, res res challenge response handshake is used, meaning, um, for example, the central um, sends the command open door to the chematic. This is the command. Um, then the chematic generates um, a random challenge, sends this challenge back to the central. The central encrypts this challenge with um, the AS key known by both devices. Um, meaning um, encrypts this challenge with the known shared secret and sends um, this encrypted uh, message back to the chematic. The chematic decrypts um, the payload um, and then knows, okay, the central is my central and I'm allowed to unlock the door. Um, in the past, there were numerous problems um, with um, the AES handshake when you changed the default AES key. So still, um, some people say that you should not change the default AES key and use, um, and use the default one um, to avoid problems. And one other disadvantage of the AES handshake is um, it has a very high latency. So for example, you can't really use it if you want um, to switch floor, floor lights, for example. Um, Yes, um, before showing our first attack, um, I'd like to mention uh, the most simple attack. The most simple attack is um, a burglar who wears a jammer device, which uh, jams the air traffic. Uh, that means uh, it uh, sends a carrier louder than the motion sensor so that uh, the alarm system cannot hear the um, motion detected packet uh, from the motion detector. So, now uh, let's start our first attack. What are the requirements for the attack? It's actually not a lot. We are using a Raspberry Pi. Then we need some kind of wireless transceiver module for the Raspberry Pi in order to um, yeah, being able to send and receive BitCos packets. You could use the um, so-called CUL, which you can buy at buzzware.de, but um, we are using um, a self-made device we, we named CRC, um, yeah, which you can see. Let me switch to the Either there or on our next slide. Yeah, right, we have a picture of it. Uh, there's the webcam. There it is. Um, this is the CRC um, on the Raspberry Pi. And third, we need some kind of software to interpret the um, signals of the wireless transceiver module, and of course we are using home gear. Yeah, that's again the CRC. Here it's still named Cox. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, our, our first attack uh, is uh, 
um, only uh, is not much more than uh, copying, uh, copy pasting a uh, motion detector packet. For this, we need uh, two informations. The first information is um, the address of the motion sensor used, and the second information is uh, no. Um, sorry, we only need uh, the address um, of the motion detector. No, and now, the address of the switch. And and the address of the switch, of course. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, for that, we need to sniff uh, one packet containing both information, and then um, more or less uh, copy-pasting this packet and sending it to the switch, and the light goes on without the motion detector detecting any motion. The important question now is, when we sniff packets, of course there are a lot of packets in the ether, especially uh, when it's a larger um, automation system or, or when there are a lot of devices. So we need a way to detect motion detector packets. So how does a motion detector packet look like? The easiest way to get this information is to look at the, at the device's XML files, uh, which you can find in the file system of the CCU or which is also provided with the BitCost service software, which you can download from the Homatic website. And then in this XML file, there is a section called frames, which contains um, most of the packets um, known by this device. And in, the, in this frame, frames section, you can find this frame, um, which has a packet, a message type of 41. Hexadecimal? Which you can see here, hexadecimal, yeah. And um, a, a, payload of, a payload size of yeah. four bytes. Hmm? Yeah, which is uh, encoded in byte two of the packet. Yeah. Um, and has a payload size of four bytes, as you can see here. And um, with the last nibble being zero, this packet really is specific for motion detectors. Um, so this is the packet we are looking for and we are sniffing for. Um, after this packet, I'm just telling you in advance because you will, you will see it in a few seconds. Um, this is the packet from the motion detector to the switch and the switch will respond with um, an acknowledged packet. Okay, let's do the take. Warte yeah. noch kurz mit der Batterie. There's some short information. Uh, this is uh, the system of the victim, and this is the hardware of the attacker. Okay. Here we are logged in two times um, over SSH into our Raspberry Pi. Um, um, and the first yeah, question is, how do we sniff packets? Sniffing actually is pretty easy um, because all the packets are logged into the home gear log file, so we just use tail. It's a little hard to read from here. Usually we do not log in as root. <laughs> and here you can see all the BitCos packets received by home gear or by our, by our wireless transceiver module. Now, um, Mali inserts the battery into our victim's motion detector. We just removed it uh, because otherwise the light would, would switch on and off all the time. And now if we wait a little bit, hopefully. Mm -hmm. I think it's crashed. No. Yes, it is. It's crashed. As you can see, it works perfectly. This is not part of the attack, by the way. We just want to switch on the light. Oh, 
Okay. Maybe we shouldn't have removed the batteries. Yeah, it uh, detects when the batteries are inserted. Okay, now we know that's the motion detector. Okay, uh, we can't show you what we wanted to show you, but uh, we can use a little, we can generate our own packet. We can construct our own packet. We'll use the backup of our sniffing before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm Beneath sorry, us, normally we, we wanted- We can sniff the two addresses. Yeah, normally we wanted to sniff um, the motion detector packet and uh, copy paste it to the right side. But as that is not possible now, let's just connect to our home gear daemon. Now we are um, connected or, yeah. Um, now we are within the command line interface of home gear. By default, home gear knows two virtual devices. The second one we don't need now, that's um, the virtual central. And the first one is um, a device we call spy device, uh, which is actually the one, the, the device which logs all, the, all these packets um, to the log file. And we need the first one. Yep, now oh, it works. It's working, perfect. Mm, needed some time for booting. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's show it once again. Uh, we have to wait some seconds uh, till the light uh, turn off again. You can use, the, no, yeah, no, you have to wait. Yeah. yeah. But uh, you can see already here is the packet okay. we just talked about with the message type 41. Once After again. This, that is the um, sender address. You can see the sender address and the destination address um, being the address of the switch. Once again? Yeah, once again. Okay, once again. Okay, there it is again, and there is um, the packet after that, remove the battery. Okay. The packet we after that um, is the, um, the acknowledged packet from the switch. Okay. Okay. Now, we are really... Now we can't cheat anymore. No. <laughs> there, is no there are no batteries anymore in the motion detector. Um, now, when we um, type help, you can see the spy device um, supports a command called send with which we can send arbitrary BitCost package, and we are using this command and just copying, and just copy the packet from the right side to the left. I press enter, and nothing happens. Hmm. We did something wrong, I think. We'll try it again. Try it again, yeah, we, we will. We will. Um, when you remember the slide, um, maybe you saw that part of the payload is a counter, at byte 10 here. And um, when you sniff more packets, and you, as we sniffed more than one packet, um, you can see here, it's, for me it's hard to see right now from this angle, but um, if you look through all these packets, you will see that the counter um, increments by one with each motion e event. So maybe let's just try to do the same and increment the counter by one. And da da. <laughs> that was the first attack. You see, it's quite simple to emulate homatic devices. And now the second attack. Yeah. Okay, how to annoy your neighbor? Only. One way to annoy your neighbor. Uh, um, you have a, um, a thermal control device and um, yeah, uh, mounted on, uh, on the wall of your room and um, um, a valve drive device mounted to the valve of uh, your radiator. These two devices are peered into each other and each one of them is paired into a central. So our next attack is not that simple, but still we can manage uh, to um, change the set point temperature to always on, so that the valve drive uh, um, position is uh, fully opened and uh, yeah. 
You can imagine. We can have some fun, or maybe a burglar can use it too. For social hacking to uh, make uh, the victim open the window. Okay, and um, that's uh, uh, for yeah. explaining how the attack moves. Uh, let's. Uh, um, yeah, maybe you, you remember this slide. We have a problem now because we can't just send the new set point temperature to the um, thermal control device. Why is that? In our first example, the, the switch we used um, to um, turn on and off the light was always um, receiving. It was always in receive ready mode. The thermal control now is a device of this kind, meaning it sends wake me up packets um, every few minutes and then goes to sleep again. That means if we would use the command send we used uh, at, uh, in the last attack, we would need to send within this window of 250 milliseconds. That's kind of hard to do. Manually. Manually. So we need a different kind of approach. Ooh. Ah. Okay, the first step is um, we need uh, two um, informations. The first information is uh, the address of the uh, thermal control device, and the second information we need is the address of uh, the victim's central. And in the attack, we have to uh, change home gear's uh, central address to the victim's central address, because otherwise um, the victim's uh, uh, thermal control device, which is paired to the victim's uh, central, would not accept uh, packets from our um, uh, home gear device because uh, it has uh, the wrong uh, address. Then uh, we have to manually add uh, the victim's thermal control to home gear in order to make uh, home gear manage uh, the timing of the attack because manually uh, you can hardly um, hit the 250 milliseconds window. Uh, the third step is uh, to change the set point temperature. And uh, the fourth step is to switch the thermal control mode into central mode, because if the um, thermal control device is in a non-central mode, it would not use this uh, um, temperature set before by us um, for the actual uh, valve drive device. Um, both uh, the easiest way to um, do both uh, steps is using RPC functions, uh, set value, and port param set. Uh, so, uh, slide before. Sorry. Yeah, now our first step is, or we need to identify um, the address of a thermal control. And to do that, we need a packet that is specific for thermal controls again. And yeah, the XML files are our friend. So we just um, look into the XML file of the thermal control device and there find a packet um, with a message type of 58 which is specific for thermal controls. So we just need to sniff for a packet of this message type, which we are doing now. While we talked, Home Gear, of course, was recording all the packets um, received. And as you can see here, uh, there is a packet with message type 58. So this most definitely is a thermal control device. And this is the address of our thermal control, 1D E790. The second address here, the destination address, is the address of the valve drive. So this is the packet sent from the thermal control to the valve drive. And yeah, then the second information we need is um, the address of the central. Um, to identify the central address, you need um, just to look for different kinds of status packets sent to the, centris, sent to the central. We are not um, 
yeah, I'm not going to show you or um, yeah what the status packets are, but there should be one here in this list. Uh, but before doing the attack, mm -hmm. please switch to the webcam to prove uh, the oh yeah we will drive do that. We will is do that. almost close. Here, for example, that's uh, one C six nine four zero. Yeah, that's the central address. That's a status packet sent to the central. Okay. Yeah. What okay. you switch? One second. There. Okay. As you can see, uh, the weft um, is opened by only 17 percent. Maybe show the thermal control and too. The thermal control has the uh, actual temperature of uh, 21.8 degrees. It uh, doesn't matter. And uh, what's uh, Okay, and uh, no, you have to yep. release the button and yeah, set point a set point temperature of 19.5 uh, degrees. And the mode is manual. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Okay. Now, let's do the actual attack. First, you remember um, the second device was the, the central. This is the central address, and this address is wrong. So we need to change it. In order to, that, to do that, we remove the central. And create a new one. with the correct address, with our victim's central address, 1C6940. Then we need a completely arbitrary serial number. It can really be anything. We use the serial number vcentral01. And the device type, as you can see here, the device type of the central device is FF, 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 FD. And now we have a new central. There it is. Now we select the central. And here you can see there is a command called peers add to manually add peers without pairing them with, um, to the central. And we are doing exactly that. Peers add. Uh, now we need the device type first. The device type you can find um, in the XML file. The device type of the thermal control is 3.9. Then we need the address, which was 1D E790. Then we need, again, an arbitrary serial number. We call it virtual thermal control 1. And the firmware version. Um, the most current firmware ver version is 2.1. Um, this information you can also get out of the XML file or by just inserting a battery in a thermal control, then it will display the, film, the firmware version. And now, Home Gear knows the thermal control of our, of our victim. We are logging out. We don't need the command line interface anymore. And now, we need to tell Home Gear to set the new set point temperature for us. To do that, um, as Mali already told you, we are using RPC function. One way to do that is to use a simple PHP script. I call it setpoint.php. Oops, sorry. And this script actually is pretty simple. The class I'm using. Um, pretty much only uses um, the XML RPC functions provided by PHP itself, so it's really nothing special, and you can download it from the Home Gear website. And um, as you can see, we are sending two RPC functions. The first one is set value to the thermal control we just created in Home Gear. You remember we named it um, VTC1. Um, the variable, the variable name is set point. Again, this information is out of the XML file. And we set set point to 100, 
100 is a special value, meaning always on. And the second RPC function we are using is put param set. Put param set is used to set configuration parameters. Um, so we are using put param set to um, change the mode of the thermal control to central mode in case it is not in central mode. And again, this information is out of the XML file. Um, we uh, change the variable mode temperature regulator to the value two, and two is um, the central mode. Okay. Now, we are just executing our script. On the right side, on the left side in the log, you can see that HomeGear received both, both RPC packets. Now we need to wait a little bit um, because uh, yeah, it takes two to three minutes for the thermal control to send a wake me up packet. And yeah, then home you start sending. In the meantime, I am showing you what you will see. There will be a little more packets than you saw in the last example. This is the wake me up packet. And in response to the wake me up packet, Home Gear will send a wake up packet. The thermal control will send an acknowledge, and then um, Home Gear will send the new set point temperature in this packet, um, encoded in the last payload byte, C8 being 100.0 or the special value always on. And an acknowledge again. Encoded as um, 200 in decimal, uh, so that you can encode um, uh, values between uh, 0 and uh, 100 in 0.5% uh, steps. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the second RPC function put param set causes home gear to do this directly after setting the set point temperature. As the central mode is a configuration parameter, um, it is handled as uh, setting configuration parameters, which is done always in the same way. Um, setting configuration parameter starts with a start configuration packet and ends with an end configuration packet. And in between is the packet to actually set the configuration parameter, which is encoded here in the last byte. A lot of information for one byte, but yeah. And in between are acknowledged packets so that um, HomeGear knows that the packets were really received. Okay, let's switch back and see if something happened. Yeah. Um, Actually, it did. It, it did, yeah. Uh, where's the wake me up packet? Okay, um, wake me up packet. One sec. Okay, we re in this case, <laughs> we responded to the packet sent to, to the, of message type 5.8, so not actually to the broadcast packet. This is working too. This is the packet sent from um, the thermal control to the valve drive. And um, after this packet, um, here you can see the um, set point temperature being set, the configuration start packet, the setting of um, the mode to central mode, and the configuration end packet. Okay, now I'm switching to the webcam again. And as we can see, the valve drive opens the valve step by step, 88%. Okay, 98, 98%. that's maximum. Almost fully opened. And here and the you set can see point temperature. the set point temperature is on. And here you can see that the thermal control is in central mode. That was the second attack. OK, last one. Time is short. So. OK. Um, yeah. Third attack, uh, we, we're going to show you how to open uh, victim's door if the victim has not changed the default AES key. 
that's probably the case for a lot of people and if the reason is being lazy, but I think a lot of sy systems still use the default AES key. We might do some word driving to uh, um, uh, see how many people uh, changed the AES key. Um, so again, we need two, two informations. The first information is um, the address of the keymatic device. And uh, the second information we need to know is um, uh, the keymatic device. And the second information is uh, the address of the victim's central. So we have to sniff both informations. And uh, as soon as we got these two informations, we can send uh, stop, 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 the command stop. open door um, together with uh, the um, AES handshake with the default key. For that sniffing, we might use uh, the um, Raspberry Pi and the CRC. But for, using, uh, for sending the AES handshake, we uh, need a uh, uh, LAN configuration adapter um, together with a BitCost service running on uh, our computer. Okay. Yeah, sadly, HomeGear can't, doesn't know the default AES key, so we can't generate the AES handshake. Okay, let's start by sniffing. You already know the procedure. And yeah, Mali, you're the victim. Close the door. Okay. Oh yeah, the webcam. Can we? Okay, I have the door still open. Now I close it. Okay, and he, there you saw. Um, here are the packets. Okay, now I put away the key. Okay, this is the packet we received. So the first, the sender address is the address of the remote, and the second address is the address of our Kematic, 23DD6F. So now, and, and from, previous, from the previous attacks you already know, or from, or from the previous attack you already know the central's address. So now let's do the attack. One sec. What we need to do is, first, we need to change the address of the LAN configuration adapter to the address of um, the victim central. Otherwise, again, the Kematic wouldn't accept our packets. Then, we need to manually add um, the victim's Kematic to the BitCost service. And after that, we can just use the RPC function set value again to set the state of the Kematic. In this case, um, the state would be open or close the door. No, lock or unlock the door. Oops. Okay, let's do it. First, I don't touch the, key, uh, the remote control. This is the um, configuration folder of the BitCost service, C program data BitCost service. And you see the, there, there are no devices, that's why this folder is empty. And I am copying the template file into this folder. And there are no secrets, I'm going to show you what is in this template file. Actually, we need, we need to modify it too. And you see this template file looks pretty empty. Um, there are no, um, yeah. And in this template file, we just need to enter two information. First, the address of the Kematic, 23DD6F. That's what we just sniffed. And we need 23DD6F. And we need to enter the, the serial number of our BitCos interface, of our BitCos, uh, of, of our LAN configuration adapter. Of course, we know that one. And the address is 314785. 
three one four seven eight. Okay, now let's save it. Close it now. <laughs> now we start the Bitcoin service on our attacker system. It's running and we are again using PHP. The script looks the same as the one you saw on the Raspberry. It's really just sending set value. And the door opens. Okay. Now, how can you detect and prevent these kinds of attacks? For the devices using the AES handshake, please change it. I think in recent firmware versions, um, most of the problems should have been solved. And we tried, but till now, uh, we didn't find a way to circumvent um, the AES handshakes in general. Um, you can detect attacks of the second kind. If um, the software supports this function? Yeah, if, if the software supports it, um, by um, I'm trying to detect if an other device uses your central's address, of course, if yourself or if the, soft, the, the software knows its own address, so if somebody else uses its own address, it's easy to detect that. HomeGear actually does that. But and sadly, you can only detect an attack, but not um, pre um, Yeah, you cannot prevent, prevent it. it. And the third thing you can do to prevent, or not, no, to detect um, attacks of the first kind is to do a plausibility check of the message counters. Again, it's only a detection of um, a possible attack, but yeah, there is no way um, to prevent these kinds of attacks. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, we have time for a few questions, uh, but before, if you leave the room, please take all your trash with you. And if you leave during the Q&A session, please do so quietly. Thank you. Do we have questions from the internet? Können wir das Mikrofon da hinten eingeschaltet bekommen? Ja, wir haben ein, äh, eine Frage. Ähm, the question is, uh, can you also emulate a terminal control? So the terminal control itself, can it be emulated by sending commands to it? Uh, I don't completely understand the question. We could emulate all the function of a thermal control, or is the question uh, to emulate a thermal control in order to, um, to control a valve drive? I don't know. Uh, actually, Home Gear does exactly that. Home Gear is emulating a thermal control device in order to um, being uh, in, yeah in order to control a valve drive. It's a virtual um, thermal control device running on Home Gear, uh, pretending as if this device were a um, physical um, thermal, thermal control. control. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, next question from the audience um, on the left here. Yeah, hi. Um, hello. Yeah. Uh, you basically, for the attack where you you know you warm up your neighbor's house, you're spoofing the central control, right? Is there not a erase condition? Uh, I mean, how does that work with the official, uh, the real router, the real central unit? 
um, what is the resetting messages? Yeah, we, the oh, you mean when both, what, what happens when both devices send messages? <laughs> That's a valid question. Um, when the real central controls the set point temperature, it will not set the set point temperature um, every cycle, only every few cycles. So in the cycles between that, um, you can set your set point temperature and of course the valve drive will um, open and close constantly, but still you have the same effect. Next question from the right. Um, would it be possible to do sort of wall driving and map the kinds of devices using an SDR radio? Uh, you mean what the hardware requirements for wall driving would be? Is it, is it even possible to, to drive to alongside the road and map the kinds of devices that are used in the buildings on the left and yeah. the right? Yeah, it is possible, but some devices only very rarely send packets. So in order to really detect all the devices used in the houses around you, you would have to wait a long time in front of each house. And have you tried that using an SCR? No. Or no. only that special hardware? No, uh, we did not use a software-defined radio. Um, it's not necessary. Um, we simply need a Raspberry Pi costing uh, uh, about 40 euros and um, a wireless adapter uh, costing between uh, 50 um, and 100 bucks. I'm asking because you could simply use a Realtek modified so it's only 21 euros. Okay, um, if you want to, um, uh, possibly you might use one. Um, as, okay. uh, it would work. It would work um, if it uh, supports um, the um, uh, frequency 868 uh, um, megahertz and um, uh, the um, the shift keying mode, uh, which is ex actually used, um, the uh, CC1100 um, uh, chip uh, does support uh, several um, transmission modes, um, uh, but I don't know exactly which uh, mode is used because we don't need to know. Thank you. Okay, next question from the left. Uh, I, I'm, uh, this was exactly what I also would have asked, the frequency, because uh, home automatic systems uh, usually use this 800 megahertz and not 2.4 gigahertz because of the, uh, the, the distance they, they can play. Um, so it is a standard protocol is used and not a proprietary protocol. So the standard chip on the devices which everybody might buy. Yes. The chip is standard, but the bit cost protocol is the protocol used is not standard. Is the bit cost protocol documented just by reverse engineering or by the company itself? Uh, to be, I'm not 100% sure if it's documented, but I don't think so. We reverse engineered it. Okay, thank you. So, next question from the left. Uh, hi, I, uh, I was wondering about the um, challenge response messages with the keymatic exchange with the uh, homematic system. Uh, I was wondering if you could give us any more information about how that is. Uh, so, for instance, the challenge that sent, how does, um, how does that get integrated into the message that's encrypted and returned? You mean how the, how the payload is calculated? Right. I mean, do you just simply concatenate we don't know. the challenge? No. We don't know anything? exactly. Okay. We don't know exactly. We can only guess. Um, yeah, probably yeah. Um, it's um, on the slide. Let me just see. Let me just open it. Uh, where is it? One sec. Um, on this slide, you can see that here are six bytes and here are four bytes and both are within this um, encrypted um, response. So this, that is um, 10 of 16 bytes used already. So there are six bytes left. And uh, probably 
at least three of these six bytes are one of the addresses. Maybe the six bytes are the sender and the destination address. We know that because address spoofing is not working. We tried that already. Um, but uh, we are not 100% sure if it works. And um, what is also not possible by changing the default AES key, probably we have to try again. We haven't worked on that for quite a time. But probably um, not only your AES key is used, but a combination, maybe XORD, whatever, of your AES key and the default AES key. So you cannot just change the default AES key with a conf configuration adapter and then implement um, the challenge response. Yeah, it's, that's still a little mystery how exactly the AES handshake works. OK, next question from the right. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I wondered if you have looked into other vendors like FS20. Um, yes. Yeah. Do you expect similar? Uh, uh, yeah. Or is it different? Uh, um, FS20 is pretty stupid. It's not, it's, it's, um, it existed um, before Homatic. Homatic, uh, yeah, they developed Homatic after FS20. Um, FS20 is unidirectional. The devices don't really have addresses. You have, uh, I don't know, I'm not, uh, I think you have master addresses and group addresses and something like that, but you have not um, unique device addresses and there are not a lot of addresses available. Um, yeah, but uh, we plan to support other systems too in um, home gear, like FS20, for example. Home Homematic wired, of course. Okay, next question from the left. Uh, great work, guys. Uh, <laughs> what about the, the CRC board? Uh, did you design it by yourself, or uh, is it uh, somewhere to buy? And why didn't you use uh, the uh, the busware stuff? Um, Yes, the main reason why we didn't use the busware stuff is uh, we wanted to keep uh, an exact timing. This was necessary to um, emulate a thermal control um, communicating with a valve drive device. And uh, the CRC device uh, we have designed um, on our own. It's um, a little bit inspired by the busware's um, COC device. Um, um, it uses a, a special a bottom entry um, connector so it can fit into a Raspberry Pi case. Um, but in contrast to the um, busware uh, COC device, it does not communicate um, uh, via UART, um, via a microcontroller with a um, a CC1100 uh, chip, but it communicates directly via SPI with the um, transceiver chip. Okay, another question. Uh, did you look into uh, the RWE uh, stuff for it uses exactly the same hardware, just a slightly different protocol? No, we haven't. Um, no, we haven't. <laughs> okay, next question from the right. Did you uh, get in touch with Homatic, and if so, how did they respond? Uh, yes. I don't know. I wrote, um, they are not, uh, we wanted to post Home Gear on, um, home, on, on the forum Homatic Insight, and EQ3 was not particularly ha happy about that. Um, one reason was because Home Gear uses um, the Bitcoin services XML files, and they were directly integrated into the software. We now removed that. It's not directly integrated into Home Gear anymore. It's, it's still used by Home Gear, but now it's being downloaded um, and on the client, at the client side. Um, um, I wrote EQ, EQ3 because I don't want to have any problems with them, but um, until now, they still haven't responded. Okay, then let's give them again a big round of applause. Thank you very much for this talk.